Jude gives us strength in our internal spirit. But on this cool middle the sacred hour, when the two most important holy days we have, Yom Kippur and Shabbat, intertwine, where is God in all of this? There's a famous story. There's always a famous story. This one you know. While out to sea, a boat hit a large rock and began to sink. The survivors went onto life rafts, except one man who told them, God will save me. They shrugged their shoulders and went into their life rafts. Then a boat came by and offered to help him. He said, no, thanks. I'm waiting for God to save me. Then after the boat was nearly sunk, a helicopter came and offered to save him. Again, he responded with, no, thanks. I'm waiting for God to save me. As the man became more deeply concerned, another boat came by. Again, the people aboard offered this man some help, and again, he politely declined. I'm waiting for God to save me, he said again. After some time, he drowned. <laughs> Upon reaching heaven, he had a chance to speak with God briefly and said, Why did you let me die? Why didn't you answer my prayers? God responded, I did. I sent you a life raft, a helicopter, and two boats. <laughs> this famous story reminds us that there is a distinction between a literal idea of God and the symbolism of God. If we look at our Yom Kippur liturgy, we can see and feel this tension. And maybe this is exactly what we should be contemplating during this 24-hour period of thoughtful reflection. Does our High Holy Day prayer book, which we call Mahzor, reflect our personal theology? The liturgy we have read this evening, like the Unitana Tokef, which talks about God deciding who shall live and who shall die, and the Abinu Malkana, which refers to God as our Father, as our King, is not a theology that I, and I suspect many of you resonate to. Through our life experiences, many of us have experienced theology in different ways. Grief and painful experiences often help move us along in terms of our belief in God, and sometimes force us to reevaluate what we used to think of God in light of our current experience. If our experiences do not force us to question God's existence, then I'm not sure we are paying enough attention. After my mother died, for example, my daughter and I have spent numerous hours discussing the concept of God. Granted, we've talked about God for nearly her entire 24 plus years. What else do I guess? And we both have agreed that there is no active God in history that controls our actions. There is no puppet master maneuvering our movements in what we do. So for my daughter and me, and for many Jews, the theology that we pray together on this night does not match what we truly believe or what we have personally experienced about God. So new, why pray these words? Thus, my task on this most holy night is to share with you why even though I do not take the theology of the prayer book literally, I find prayer grounding, meditative, and extremely beneficial. Prayer is vital to build one's spiritual body, just like eating right and working out helps to build our physical body. As Reformed Jews, we are not bound by traditional limits. We are not bound by interpretation of the Torah being literal truth. We are not bound by a view that in our heart of hearts, we know feels wrong. Yes, we are bound by proper behavior. We are bound by trying to achieve a level of menschlichkeit. But we, but we do the right thing because deep inside of each of us, we know it is the right thing to do. Not because God on high tells us or demands this behavior of us. <clears throat> a traditional Jewish view of God, Yahweh, the God of the Bible, created the earth in six days, 5,775 years ago. Adam and Eve are the first humans, and the book of Genesis is literal truth. If one believes in this type of deity, then they must follow every word of the Torah, and they would be halakhic Jews, meaning they follow Jewish law. And the definition of God, based on this belief, is anthropomorphic, omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent God. If one believes in such a creator God, then the expectation of that God would be that it would create organisms that have optimal design. And we all know that all organisms have features that are suboptimal. In fact, I have a list. <laughs> Thus, God either did not create 
create these organisms, or, or is not omnipotent, omniscient, or omnibenevolent. My professor of blessed memory, Alvin J. Rhinus, would say in regards to biblical view of God, if there was such a God, then no purposeless, harmful events would take place. And we know they do take place, so this type of God does not exist. Done. Rhinus taught that the bottom line for such a belief is based on a dystheological surge. I want my favorite word to say that. Dystheological surge. Yeah, say that ten times now. Which is the concept that there is unnecessary evil, like the Holocaust, or a two-month-old dying of some disease. This would have no purpose, and thus would be evidence that there is not a God active in the world. Rhinus goes on to explain, accordingly, since there is no objective and compelling evidence that persons can bring to convince their sense of reality that some particular concept of deity is true, and the sense of reality without such convincing evidence cannot be persuaded by conscious acts of will, persons have no conscious control over what they believe about God. The belief is fashioned subjectively out of the person's total psychic being, a complex of differing modes of awareness and attitudes, conscious and unconscious. Thus, the only thing we know about God is what we personally experience. Think about that. It is completely subjective. Rhinus continues, if it is the case that humans are all unique individuals, each of us whom differs from the others, then it would be the case that the views of God or ultimate reality of every person's will, to some degree, small or large, differ from those of every other. The results of biological research indicate that such uniqueness is, in fact, the case. Accordingly, the ideal of the Orthodox community that every member accept the same concept of God is contrary to our nature as human beings. The uniqueness of the individual human being is described this way by leading biologist Ernest Mayer, who stated, living organisms are characterized by uniqueness. Every population of organisms consists of uniquely distinct individuals. No two cells within an organism are precisely identical. Each individual is unique. Needless to say, Rhinus's idea that Reformed Judaism is a polydoxy, meaning we have many different beliefs, not one single belief, which is an orthodoxy, rings true. Wright has stated that only the polydox religious community, committed as it is to the autonomy of every individual member, is qualified to serve the uniqueness of every person that is rooted in our very genes. The concepts of God that have been most widespread among Jews are those that come under the category of theosupernaturalism. Careful examination of the theosupernaturalistic concepts to which Jews have subscribed put decisively to rest the notion that the essence of all Jewish religious systems is belief in one God. On the contrary, scientific biblical research indicates that until approximately the 8th century BCE, all Jews believed in the existence of many gods. This means if we date the origins of the Jewish religion from 2000 to 1800 BCE, which is commonly the accepted time of the early patriarchal period, all Jews believed in the existence of more than one God for at least a period of some 1,000 years. It appears likely that basically four different theosupernaturalistic concepts of deity were subscribed to at various times in the biblical period. One is polytheism, in which different gods were considered to possess different powers, with one god overseeing agriculture, for example, and another war. Different gods are worshipped as the occasion required. The second concept is henotheism, in the form of each nation possessing its own national god. Under henotheism, the national god of the Jews was Yahweh, whom alone they worshipped, but the gods of other nations were acknowledged. The third concept was an advanced henotheism, or pre-monotheism, in which Yahweh was seen as more powerful than any other gods, but the existence of other gods was not denied. The fourth concept, which you all know well, is a pure monotheism, in which other gods besides Yahweh were declared non-existent. Although the 8th century BCE prophets appear to have arrived at Yahvistic monotheism, the notion of one god does not seem to have 
been accepted generally by Jews until after the return from Babylonian exile in the 5th century BCE. The most significant change in monotheism that occurred subsequent to the biblical period was made by the Pharisees perhaps around the 2nd century. Generally, according to biblical religion, there is no life after death, although a meaningless existence in Sheol after death is occasionally mentioned in the Tanakh, in the Bible. The Pharisees introduced the belief that the deity does provide an afterlife with the righteous after a miraculous resurrection to join a life of eternal bliss. The only way a religious community can attempt to avoid this all but inevitable diversity is to pronounce itself orthodox and authoritarian, and outlaw as evil and sinful all other God views than its own. This paradoxy is rooted existentially in the uniqueness of every individual, a uniqueness for which the evidence from biological science as well as history is overwhelming. Our movement of Judaism, Reform Judaism, is born during the age of the Enlightenment. In Germany, as science and philosophy gain greater understanding, we have the creation of documentary hypothesis, the idea that the Torah is written by different authors or schools of thought. It is not the first time the idea that our Torah is written by humanity occurs. Actually, it truly started by the great 17th century Dutch philosopher Baruch Spinoza, who laid the groundwork for 18th century Enlightenment and modern biblical criticism. He created the stage on which Krauth and Wilhausen could establish documentary hypothesis. But Spinoza did something else for us. By creating a rational approach to theology, he opened the door to a more open view that theology does not have to be based on Torah. Thus, many Jews embraced a more rational and evidence-based theology because of him. Thus, he sets the foundation for a new way of looking at theology. Reformed Judaism embraces this more rational theological approach. Our movement, which was born in Hamburg, Germany in the early 1800s, is initially a very rational type of Judaism, which on one hand is wonderful in the sense that Judaism has to make sense. But so too it easily falls into a too rational type of Judaism that can lack heart and a sense of spirituality. In the 70s, I recall, that was still the case. Reformed Judaism was very rational, very little God talk, and we were still educating our young that we need to be Jewish because the Holocaust wiped out over half of our population. I'm very glad we moved away from a Holocaust-based rationale for being Jewish. Never forget is key, no doubt about it, but as a reason to be Jewish. No. Spinoza also set the stage for a new type of theology, that Mordecai Kaplan would create, and that is a naturalistic theology, the idea that God's a process in nature, part of the natural cycle of the universe. God creates our universe and can be experienced only through nature, is something that many Reformed Jews embrace today, thanks to Spinoza and Kaplan. Let me ask you, from a modern approach, how do we know God exists? I am a Reformed Jew. The concept of evidence is absolutely vital for and truthfully, the only thing we know about God is what we personally experience. Thus, it is all subjective. There cannot be one truth. And any religion that professes that there is one truth is in denial of the real reality before us. I love being part of a belief system that is polydoxian, believing there is no one truth but a multiplicity of truths out there. And each of us needs to discover for ourselves what we believe about God. As I say in our B'nai Mitzvah class, as Reformed Jews, we get to believe up to one God. <laughs> so given all this, knowing we do not have an orthodox view of God, how do we pray from a prayer book that feels orthodox in its theology? This is the true struggle of a liberal Jew. This is why the rabbis of this era, my colleagues, in the Reform movement felt it was time to create a new high holiday mafsor. You will hear more about this tomorrow during the Ritual Committee study session. But the reality is that there is not one belief in God, and thus a prayer book must reflect the different choices available to us. So yes, having a prayer book that reflects a more honest theology is important. But there are still going to be prayers and blessings that do not necessarily connect to our individual theology. Prayer, from my perspective, is not about talking with God. I know for some it is, and that is perfectly acceptable. 
But for me, prayer is not a theologically centered activity. Prayer for me connects us to our heritage, the traditions of our ancestors. It is part of that door by door equation. Knowing that we are praying the same prayers we've prayed for hundreds upon hundreds of years connects us to our avot, our ancestors. Prayer is a moment in time that we get to be self-reflective. In fact, the Hebrew word for prayer is tefillah, which actually means to be self-reflective or self-judging. It does not imply that one has to pray to something. On the contrary, it implies that prayer is a personal time to self-evaluate, to self-reflect. The goal of prayer is to take time and to meditate on ourselves, to connect with the energy around us, and within us. The prayer book should help us think and reflect, contemplate and wrestle with our human condition. Prayer is about connection to our community. When we pray together, we hear the voices and energies of those around us. We may even feel our ancestors in those moments. But for me, the feeling I get when I pray in community warms my heart and feeds my kishkas. Not that I wouldn't mind a VLC. Bagels, lots of pictures. <laughs> to be a part of something larger than our individual selves reminds us that we are part of a faith that is thousands of years old. And I, for one, feel honored to be a part of such a beautiful faith. Prayer gives us the opportunity to connect to our Jewish identity. How cool is it that we can take a thousand year plus prayer and put it to music written today? Wow. To pray something that is both ancient and modern at the same time, prayer can be very, very cool. But prayer can be a conversation, of course. For some, that conversation is with God. For others, it is a conversation with themselves. And yet, for others, it is a conversation with an energy that is greater than any of ourselves. Prayer has the power to ground us as it gives us an opportunity to reflect on those things that we do not reflect on unless we make the time. Prayer affords us an opportunity to focus on energies toward shalom, toward healing, toward a positive action that we may need to focus on. Prayer gives us a meditative time to converse within our soul, to ease us from upset and discord, to help us take a breath from our pain, to embrace who and what we really are. Prayer helps us have an inner dialogue with ourselves to better focus our actions so that we move from praying with our mouths to praying with our feet. Prayer can soothe our souls if our intention is right-minded. So the littleness of the prayer really is unimportant. For the act of prayer is to transcend the littleness of prayer and to allow our spirits to be nurtured. That is why music is a key element of prayer. The Vina Malkina may be wrong theologically for most of us, but without the music, it is not the high holy days. So when we pray it with a familiar melody in the comfort of our community, it feels right, it feels good. Not because of its theology, but because it is more about being together in our Emmanuel family than the littleness of the actual prayer. When I focus, when I pray, I focus on grounding my thoughts, easing my mind, and feeling gratitude all around me. And maybe that is the best answer to why we pray, because we can. We are free to pray in any way without theological restrictions. Modim anach nulach, one of the most important prayers that we have, which occurs in our daily liturgy, it is known as the Hoda'ah prayer and reminds us how blessed and fortunate we truly are. The Hoda'ah, or Thanksgiving prayer, helps us to understand that feeling true and genuine gratitude can open our hearts to receive others as they really are. I think that's a really good reason to pray. In the story that I told earlier, the man on the sinking boat was waiting for God to save him. What he did not understand, like many who view prayer from a singular lens, is that from my perspective, God is energy, just as we are. And when we connect to that energy internally, we are more likely to care for another. This God, however we define that word, can only save us through each other. The evidence makes clear that God is in how we act toward another, not to whom we pray. When we focus on gratitude and not on what we don't have, prayer becomes authentic and real. Modim anach nulach. Thank you, God and Spirit of the universe, for bringing us to this place as one extended family.